Knopp on Network Africa. President-elect of Kenya, William Bruto, speaks for the first time since his rival, Ali Odinga, rejects the results, saying he will help freedom of speech and democratic values. Tunisia passes new constitution granting President Kais Saeed more unchecked powers. Plus, the United Nations Mine Action Service clears out 25 anti-personnel mines from Kigi County in South Sudan. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Tenyo Lashubowale. We begin in Kenya, where President-elect William Ruto says there is no time to waste in tackling an economic crisis as defeated rival Rally Odinga prepares a legal challenge to overturn his loss in the August 9th election. Mr. Ruto was declared President-elect on Monday by Kenya's Electoral Commission chairman after a closely fought race to lead East Africa's richest country before all of the seven election commissioners have challenged the results. Mr. Odinga said he will contest the decision in court, calling it a travesty. However, Mr. Ruto says he's forging ahead with creating an administration, promising that no Kenyan would be excluded, whatever their political or ethnic affiliation. I want to say that uh, this afternoon to ask all of us as leaders in Kenya to learn from the people of Kenya who have settled on the issues. They now want us to deliver on the commitments that we gave the people of Kenya. And I want to say to this team that we do not have the luxury of time to waste. We even have a broader mandate because we have won 25% in 39 counties. That broader mandate comes with greater responsibility to every Kenyan. And that is why I want to say from the onset, there will be no room for exclusion of any part of the Republic of Kenya. Now, thousands of ethnic Tigrayans who have been detained in camps in northeast Ethiopia since December are being transported back to their homes. The United Nations is facilitating their return back to their homes near the border between the Afar and Tigray regions, and the operation would continue for a week. The government in Addis Ababa say they had been taken to the camps for their own safety as the civil war spread, while the state-run Ethiopian Human Rights Commission said they had been targeted because of their ethnicity and described the detention of around 9,000 Tigrayans as illegal. Their return comes as hopes of peace talks to try, the, uh, to, try to end the civil war appear imminent. Tunisia's electoral authority says the final results of a controversial referendum granting unchecked powers to the office of President Kais Saeed showed 94.6% of votes in favour. According to the electoral board, voters overwhelmingly approved the new constitution, officially announcing results from the July 25th poll. The charter was approved by just over 2.6 million people, even as turnout was considered very low at 30.5 percent. The referendum came a year to the day after President Saeed sat the government in first parliament in what rivals have branded a coup. And thanks to a change in the law last year, Angolans living abroad are now able to vote for the first time in an election. The elections are next week on August the 24th. At one restaurant in Portugal, first-time Angolan voters share their excitement and worries about the polls. Angolan chef Paulo Suarez is looking forward to voting for the first time. He works at a restaurant in Portugal's capital, Lisbon. Until a change in the law last year, members of Angola's diaspora had to travel back to the country to vote. Suarez says being able to take part fills him with emotion. It's new. For the first time in history, an Angolan in Portugal, in Europe, 
who has registered can vote. That alone brings a lot of emotion. It's the first time in my life that I'm going to vote. I didn't get to vote in the previous election, and this time I'm going to vote. I'm 51 years old, and I'm finally going to be able to vote, to be part of some decisions taken in my country. Around 14 million Angolans, both home and abroad, head to polls on August 24th. It's likely to be the tightest election since the Southern African country's first multi-party vote in 1992. Current President Joao Lourenco from the MPLA is seeking a second five-year term, but the opposition, UNITA, led by Adalberto Costa Jr., is putting up a fight. Suarez Another of those voting for the first time is one of Suarez's customers, Dania Silva. She moved to Portugal, Angola's former colonial ruler, a month ago. The 22-year-old says she's excited to contribute to her country, though also has doubts. I have faith, but to be honest, and in a more practical way, I believe there will not be political change because there is a lot of vote manipulation. Every ballot cast abroad and in all of Angola's provinces has to be sent to the capital, Luanda, to be counted. Analysts say that's raised fears of voter fraud. UNITA says 2.5 million deceased people have registered to vote. Although the electoral registry says that's likely to be because family members did not communicate their death to authorities or buried their loved ones in clandestine graves. Concerns have also been raised over the number of election observers. Members of civil society have urged people to remain at polling stations to monitor the process. The head of the National Electoral Commission has said that will be illegal and promised that the election will be impartial and transparent. A Zimbabwean MP from the ruling ZANU-PF party has been arrested over fraud and money laundering claims involving $5 million. State-run newspaper Herald reports that Justice Mayor Maria Jenna was arrested on Tuesday alongside four officials, uh, who include suspended officials of the Cotton Company of Zimbabwe. They were arrested by officers from the Zimbabwe Anti-Corruption Commission, and the five were expected to appear in court on Wednesday. The state state-controlled cotton buying and processing enterprise has recently been rocked by claims of theft of farm imputes and diversion of funds. Heads of states from the Southern Africa Regional Bloc, SADC, are meeting in the Democratic Republic of Congo for talks on economic growth and integration. A dozen heads of states arrived in the capital, Kinshasa, on Tuesday to participate in the two-day summit, which opens today. The leaders are discussing how to promote industrialization through the transformation of agriculture, the development of mineral resources, and the development of value chains at the regional level. The DR Congo also intends to seek the assistance of the bloc to restore peace and security in its territory. Another aim of the summit is the handover of the bloc leadership to Congolese President Felix Shizakedi by the current head of the bloc, Malawi President Lazarus Chakwera. And it's been a decade since 34 miners were killed in South Africa's infamous Marikana massacre. Two of the victims' wives say they are still seeking answers and accountability. Two of those who lost their husbands during the brutal killing speak about how life has not changed for the better. In commemoration of the anniversary, a 40-member cast and 13-piece band goes on stage for a musical performance reflecting on the massacre. It's been 10 years since Noshile Ngweyi and Zameka Nongu's husbands were killed on this small hill in South Africa. They were among 34 striking miners gunned down by police in the infamous Marikana massacre on August 16, 2012. The incident outside a platinum mine in the northwest province was the worst of its kind since the end of the apartheid. A decade on, and the widows of the Marikana victims are still seeking answers. This incident happened when my son was one year old. Now he's 11 years. He's always asking me, Mama, why did the police kill my father? I don't have answers for that question, especially as to what the actual reason for the killing was. 
The 10th anniversary of the killings is being commemorated in Marikana the Musical, being performed in the capital, Pretoria. Marikana. In Marikana the Musical, people dressed as minors and police enact the tragedy as some music plays in the background. To the audience and actors alike, the evil of this violence is incomprehensible. It says a lot that we are still oppressed, you know, um, in this country that we are in. You know, um, yes, things are democratic, but it doesn't really feel that way, you know, because the voice of the people can't be heard. You know, I mean, the people were just simply trying to, um, you know, raise their voices, say we want a better livelihood in this nation. We want to live better, we want to end better so we can take care of our families. The musical's writer and director, Aubrey Shekabi, says it's important to maintain a conversation around Marikana. We've had Chapville, we've had 76, we've had Patong, we've had all these things during apartheid. And then in our lifetime, during our democracy, we have this incident, we have this unfortunate incident where we, our people are gunned down, where our people are killing each other. So it is important that that conversation is put out there so that people can have that conversation. So, so for me, I think it, it's an important piece of work uh, uh, to commemorate. The musical, which premiered in 2014, delivers a blow-by-blow -blow account of the events that led to the loss of lives on one of South Africa's darkest days. Meanwhile, as a worsening power crisis hobbles Africa's most industrialized economy, many South Africans are taking matters into their own hands, fueling a massive boom in small-scale solar rooftop installations. Thanks to the solar panels on his roof, Pierre Munro only notices the blackouts that regularly plunge South Africans into darkness when complaints pop up on his Johannesburg neighborhood's WhatsApp group. The decline of debt crippled state power utility ESCOM, which produces 80% of its power from coal, is pushing South Africans to look for alternatives. Tabby Tabby has witnessed that firsthand. In just one month last year, his solar company, Granville Energy, received 349 inquiries for rooftop systems. Last year, March of last year, we said one month we got 349 requests. We hadn't seen that within a year. Um, we couldn't understand what was going on, so we stopped all sales activities and we started to analyze the data. We found out that uh, there was a huge demand for solar. At that point, a lot of interest, um, first because of uh, low shedding during COVID. Um, people didn't have trust or confidence in ESCOM's ability to solve the problem, so they started looking for alternatives. So over the past, I'll say, uh, 24 months, we've seen a continuous increase uh, month on month on demand for rooftop solar. By the time one of his customers, Leigh Dermiel, finally decided to install a 42-panel system at her swimming academy last year, her monthly power bill was running to around 26,000 rand and power cuts had begun forcing her to cancel classes. When we've got no power, we can't heat the pools, we can't filter the pools. So not only is it a power or a heat issue, it's then also a hygiene issue. Um, and obviously we've got a lot of people through our pools, so we, we need to have those pumps running and filtering at least 12 hours a day. Across South Africa, private residents as well as businesses large and small are making similar calculations. The township here at Alexandra, we don't actually, like, we're not that rich before. We can't just buy um, solar system, then we, fire, we put them on top of the roofs and etc. The money, that's the problem. That's why we're getting the, the Sasa money, you know, 350 money. Yeah. yeah. That's how they help us to, to buy food and, yeah, and clothes and etc. We can't buy solar systems and etc. As residents turn to solar, Many South Africans can now carry on with their day-to-day -day activities in spite of the power crisis. It's also come on the program. Tanzania offers internet on Africa's tallest mountain, Mount Kilimanjaro. That's in a moment.
he stay with us. Thanks for staying with us. The United Nations Mine Action Service has cleared 25 anti-personnel mines from Piggy County in South Sudan, making the area safe to inhabit. The Deputy Special Representative of the UN Peacekeeping Mission in South Sudan, Sarah Nyati, visited Canal in Piggy County alongside Fran O'Grady, Chief of Mine Action in South Sudan, to get a first-hand account of the people living here. She says people are now walking on safe ground. The ground you're standing on now, you can't really demine that manually, it's rock hard. So we needed a machine to do that. Now the nearest machine is a long boat right away, so we had to get that machine which disturbs the ground and gets rid of the mines. We had to fix it, we had to find a barge, we had to get a team and we had to get the barge up the river in time before the rain started. So it was a risk, it was a gamble. And I'm really happy to say that it worked out. And what we've done now is we've cleared this whole area behind us of anti-personnel mines. So it's really heartening to come back now, to speak to some of those people we spoke to before, to find out what difference it's made to their lives. And also to, to look at the remaining challenges and to advocate for the needs. And still in South Sudan, Bentui Town and much of Unity State, located in the northern part of the country, are underwater as a result of massive flooding. Pakistani military engineers serving with the United Nations mission in South Sudan have been working to make sure that the airport and the roads adjacent to it are not inundated. A clogged river Nile burst its banks on the onset of the rainy season in Bentu, South Sudan, making matters worse for the UN mission in South Sudan engineers trying to salvage the situation. According to the UNMISS flood officer of the Pakistani military, the situation is near critical. There's all water around. So what we did, we started off uh, with all of machinery, in, uh, started construction, uh, constructing a protection around the camp. It was the first and foremost thing which we did. For that, we worked around, uh, around the clock, like 24-7, the complete machinery it was out. And along with the machinery, the operators, the manpower and machine, they both uh, have borne the equal toll. They, they, they had been through a lot. For almost a year now, the Pakistani engineers have deployed heavy-duty pumps and numerous heavy machinery like bulldozers, excavators, graders and loaders to help them keep the waters away and to level the main road there. So far, over 80 kilometers of a dike system have been constructed and more than 1.2 million liters of water have been pumped from flooded areas. Uh, challenges, they are not over yet even. Like uh, if uh, there is heavy rain in the southern part of South Sudan or in the western part, uh, we have flood here or we have uh, some heavy amount of water which needs to be dewatered. So it's a continuous, continuous process of uh, re-raising of buns and dikes or dewatering or uh, the maintenance of the airstrip or the MSR, the main artery. It's a continuous process. Humanitarian actors are also working in other areas to ensure the waters are kept away. Residents say that these are the worst floods in 60 years due to the clogging of the Nile and also because the area is a meeting point for three main tributaries of the Nile. Agricultural land is underwater. Some homes no longer exist. Others are flooded and many have been abandoned. Some communities in search of higher ground have also been displaced. The beyond the Bentu and then and Rukona, there's a lot of places, uh, other places that are, which is a remote area which uh, which are uh, flooded as well. And if we are uh, our humanitarian um, uh, uh, colleagues or, or, or agencies, and they, if they are not uh, being able to. Uh, operate that, that it's going to affect their, their population in the local area as well. So that would be the worst case scenario. Um, you know, at the end of the day, if everything goes down water, that we may not be able to stay in that area. Even across 
With peacekeeping and humanitarian personnel continuing to find it challenging to access many areas, plans have been affected, resulting in less and less movement. If the excessive flooding persists, it may be necessary to employ new creative means to reach near and far-flung places, which might become mostly accessible only during the dry season. For now, the UNMISS military contingents from Pakistan, Mongolia and Ghana located in Bentiu remain on high alert to ensure they respond fully and promptly to any flooding breaches so that they can protect lives and livelihoods. And our Track Scooters is an eco-friendly tech mobility driven company focusing on first and last minute transportation for gated communities starting with schools here in Nigeria. The company first launched in November 2021 at the Pan-Atlantic University. Since then, they've expanded to two other private schools, communities, uh, recording over 22,000 rides with their 50 operational electric scooters. With just five minutes to the start of our next lecture, university student Nancy Enuma rushes out of her hostel. Enuma uses her phone to scan and unlock her preferred mode of transportation, a packed scooter. A journey that usually takes her 20 minutes now takes her just three minutes. It's faster to get to class and also you can use it for recreational activities, maybe in the evening when you're done with classes or when you're stressed out basically. Trek Scooters was found and self-funded by a group of four friends who had experienced how scooters made their lives easy while living overseas and decided to replicate it in Nigeria. Trek Scooter is our baby and we are really excited to, you know, to be on this project at this time, especially when um, and, um, alternatives of you know, micromobility in Nigeria are not um, clean. And then that's when we see, you know, an opportunity in this to, you know, bring it clean and also affordable transportation. The scooters are set to go as fast as 20 km per hour and can be ridden for up to six hours before needing a recharge. It costs the first five US cents to unlock the scooter and 2.5 cents for every other minute. Even if I'm running late, I'm not scared of um, how I'm going to run the whole 10 minutes journey. I would rather just log in with my phone and I'll be there in three minutes. But while the students lord the scooters for its eco-friendly, fun and affordable features, Enuma says she still has reservations of safety, a concern that the Trek scooter team said they are aware of and part of the features that they will address in their next upgrade. The new deployment that we're looking to roll out um, in about two months, uh, we come with um, a helmet for all our riders to be able to wear whenever they're riding our scooter. So we are big on safety and uh, we always um, preach this or emphasize this in every community we go from the time of launch. External funding and expansion remain top on the list as they get to scale up, including opportunities to teach students how to fabricate the scooter's parts, cutting down on imports. And Tanzania has installed high-speed internet connectivity on the slopes of Mount Kilimanjaro, Africa's highest mountain, through a national broadband project. The state's telecommunications firm launched the internet project on Tuesday, saying tourists would soon be able to communicate worldwide from the summit of the mountain. According to the information minister, internet connectivity on the mountain is expected to reach its highest point, Uhuru Peak, at over 5,800 metres above sea level in October. The mountain attracts nearly 50,000 hikers annually from across the world who attempts to reach the summit. We end the program in the Democratic Republic of Congo with the arrival of South African President Cyril Ramaphosa for the Southern Africa Regional Bloc meeting. His arrival was greeted with cultural dancing, warmly welcomed by natives at the airport. He was welcomed by music and dance with the president smiling and appreciating the culture in the host country.
that's the programme today. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Tenny Olashibo Ali. Bye for now.